Well, today on Nation, the Window Cleaners podcast, we're talking with Brandon Vaughn about employees, how much they suck, but what can you do if you have employees or not? Either way, stay tuned to WCR Nation. What's up, everybody? Jersey here from Window Cleaning Resource, and you are here. What's up? Thanks for uh, having a look around. If it's your first time, have a look around. We've got 150 plus episodes for you to binge on. So go back, watch all the content, or listen to all the content. It's found anywhere podcasts are, and on YouTube as video. So go back, watch, or listen. The conversation happens on YouTube too, so go ahead and comment there. Uh, if you are one of the OGs, one of the cool kids, if you're part of the nation, what's going on? It's because of you that I get to buy brand name stuff because you put your orders in through me, and there's so many of you. I just want to say thank you so much for everybody who uh, really does take the time to let me put the orders in for you. Uh, if you're new and haven't done that, it doesn't cost you anything extra, but uh, I make credit for it, and that's how I make my cheddar. So it's like a virtual high five of awesomeness. So if you want to do that, my number is 862-312-2026. That's a cell phone. Give me a call. Let me know. Shoot me a text. Put it all in your cart, however you want to do it. At the end of this episode, we're going to give you a code for 5% off. And, uh, yeah, it's just like a thank you. It's just like an awesomeness, cool thank you, I guess. But anyway, so here's the deal. I don't want you guys to think that I'm lazy this week by not recording an episode, but we're actually repurposing something that we did uh, as a live. So my audio kind of sucks. I'm sorry for you guys who are listening. Um, from here on out, uh, Brandon Vaughn's audio is great. Mine is not. But it was a really, really good episode uh, and uh, we talked about a lot of things that really can translate. He's always a great guest. So we're doing that now. I'm going to come back in after everything is done and get you guys a code. But here it is. This is the interview with Brandon Vaughn. What is going on, everybody? Jersey here from windowcleaner.com. And we are going to be talking today, an impromptu talk with the man himself, Mr. Well, I don't, do we even have to say your name? I think everybody by this time knows you, but it's Brandon Vaughn. Everybody knows Brandon Vaughn. <laughs> What's up, Josh? Thanks How for having me, man. man. For sure. You know, it's so funny that uh, there's a lot of people who um, do media in general, and you guys, especially with uh, Concord and Summit and everything else, you have, you're, you're at the forefront of the media side. We're trying. I mean, we're trying. I mean, it's definitely, um, you know, we, everyone on my team has a pretty big passion for just kind of helping and serving. And so yeah. you know, with that, I, I try to eat my own dog food. So if I tell <laughs> contractors to mark as heavily, heavily as they can, I got to be doing the same thing myself, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. If you guys don't know, Brandon, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who the heck are you? Like, where are you from? What are you doing? Tell us everything. Sure. So quick, quick backstory, um, home service business owner basically scaled my company all clean from zero to about 70 employees. And, um, you know, now I, I pretty much help and focus on, um, helping people in our conquer group, our conquer program, uh, through systems and coaching. So, you know, the, the big, the big part of it is all, all the lessons that I learned over the last, uh, several, several years, um, getting other smart people who are smarter than me around me and kind of continuing to pass that on to, you know, the, the ones that are also trying to do the same thing with their business. Nice. You know, what's crazy is like just with conquer and everything else, like the guys that are involved, the people that are involved with this are just like huge. It's, it's, it's beyond anything else as far as, you know, who you're able to help with just the knowledge that you're bringing to the table. Yeah, it's been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, every every day when I wake up, it's it's um it's kind of like those pinch me moments, uh, yeah. you know, because being able to just help and serve is is uh, pretty rewarding, fulfilling work. Um, mostly seeing their stories, I think, is the is the part that's the best. Yeah. How long were you in business before you decided, you know, what I'm going to dedicate now helping other people? Like, how long did that take to actually kind of come to realization for you? So I, I started working full time at age 13, washing windows with my dad um, when he had all clean back uh, way back when and worked alongside him for years and years. The day I turned 18, I went out and got my own business license, uh, jumped out and kind of got started in that. And 
Um, had a couple of totally failed businesses, completely went bankrupt and, you know, and just toasted out in, in my construction company. Um, but then I, I bought my business all clean from my dad in 2012 when he was diagnosed with heart disease uh. and couldn't work physically anymore. And the business was doing about a hundred thousand a year at that point. And so, you know, pretty much from that point, 2012, uh, to now it was just, you know, scale it and grow it. And, you know, we grew it up to about 450 K a month. Um, you know, in 2018, and then the opportunity came up to, to, to exit. And it was a really amazing experience to kind of experience that side of the sales side of the business. And I want to do it all over again. I want to start another business and nice. build it up and scale it and just continue it and document the whole process. So it's been, uh, it's been a fun journey. Isn't it kind of interesting though, when you start to help people where you get to like almost do the business thing again, you know, like vicariously through them, all of a sudden it's like, Hey, I just getting into the business and you're like, Oh, like I get to experience all that again, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's probably, um, the most rewarding part of the work is being able to, you know, see that happen again with other people, you know, not, not just with one person because the, the cleaning space is, is such an amazing industry, uh, but being able to do one to many and see, you know, a couple hundred businesses take that next leap and level up to the next level, I think has been, has been pretty cool. Yeah, that's nuts. By the way, if you guys want, this is a Facebook live, so definitely comment in, but we're going to touch a little bit kind of on, um, uh, some employee things today. And I know that, you know, what you're talking about when it comes to employees, you've hired and fired probably hundreds and hundreds of employees, but I really think that right now, is a really really tough time for a lot of guys because everybody has more work than they can deal with but yet they don't have the staff and yet Amazon's still out there hiring people at 17 bucks an hour to pick stuff off shelves but they are not hired by us nobody wants to work with their hands anymore nobody wants to actually work outside when they know what that is like let's let's dive in then if you guys have any questions too on some uh, uh, employees themselves that's kind of what I want to focus on today is just the employee side, but how many people have you hired in your life? Do you think? Yeah, I definitely say it's it's in the hundreds, but not just myself personally. Um, very quickly on in in kind of as we were growing the business, I realized that the biggest bottleneck was in the employee side, and uh, so I actually headhunted a production manager to take that over for me. Oh wow! So my skill set is really in the sales and marketing, and always has been on the marketing side. That's the part that I just absolutely love. Um, and one of the big challenges that is a little bit harder for me is sitting down with someone and walking them through step-by-step step how to do the technical side of the business. So early on in our, our stage of growth, and it was actually a big turning point for me, I hired a production manager that managed everything on the acquisition side of the employee side of the business. Oh, wow. And we learned a lot over those years. I learned a ton of stuff on company culture and how to actually have like a business that's worthy of attracting people in. Cause I think that's a big struggle is that people, you know, are just like, I just, I'm running ads and I'm, I'm doing my job postings, my job listings, and but people show up and then one week later they quit. Yeah. It's, it could be because your company is not like, um, you know, extra special enough to actually keep those people on, or you're, you aren't putting things intentionally enough to focus on the culture side of it, or maybe the uh, onboarding process isn't sifting out people well enough. Yeah. So my production manager, I actually recruited him and headhunted him. He was a manager of a trailer manufacturing facility, and he knew exactly how to run job ads, how to vet people, how to interview, how to screen, how to train, how to put together training systems. And he kind of leveled up our whole business because that was his strong suit where to me it was kind of one of my more weaker sides of yeah. the business is the, the doing it consistently every day. Cause I have like super ADD and it's hard for me to stay <laughs> focused on, on one thing. Right, so when right. he, when he owned that, um, you know, he became all of our technicians boss. And so I would literally come into the shop and see someone rooting around on the shelves and I'd be like, okay, can I help you? And he'd come back and look at me and be like, <laughs> Can I help you? <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, well, right. <laughs> I own the place. And he's like, oh shoot, you know, my yeah, my name is John. I just, uh, I just got hired on. You know, I've been working with Steve, and you know, S Steve hired him, trained him, onboarded him, and he's rocking it and crushing it and doing the performance reviews and everything else. So that frees you up to work on the other aspects of your business that are most important. Yeah, you know that that's super important is hiring people or surrounding yourself with people who are good at the things you're not good at. 
the things that you don't want to do or have, like that yeah. is a big focus. And there has to be a certain point where you get to. Obviously, you can't be in business for a year and all of a sudden go, well, I'm going to hire a hiring manager. You have to get to that point. But hiring people that are focused on your weaknesses is, is really how you build that kind of strong empire, you know? Well, I mean, who says you can't go out and hire a hiring manager within your first year? True. You know, I mean, because because one of the things that I always look at is, um, you know, and, and granted, yes, to your point, not everyone is ready that quickly in, in one year. But I will say, had I to do it all over again, I would have a lot more of an investor mindset. So investors understand things very, very clearly. They understand that whatever goes down will then go up, but it has to go down first. Yeah. So when you're looking at, you know, getting a uh, a hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand, a million dollars worth of new business into your business, an investor mindset of an owner will say, I'm gonna have to invest first. My bank account's gonna have to go down in order for it to go back up again. Yeah. And the same thing happens really with the sales side and the employee side. I've heard too many people say, Man, if I could just find enough people, if I could just get enough people into my business, we could double this year. Yeah. And my first question to them is fantastic. How much is your marketing budget for your employees? <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? H how much are you spending on, on boosted ads? How many channels are you doing it? Do you have an employee avatar? Uh, you know, do you have really specific target customers? What are all the different channels that you're currently marketing for your, when's the last time you send an email blast out to your, your um, customer list saying that you're hiring? Yeah. You know, do, do you have signs on your trucks? Do you have headhunter cards? What, what are you doing for it? And they're like, well, I got a free ad on Craigslist, $25 <laughs> ad on Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. And, and it just gets lost in the noise and the clutter. It's all, all the same things, marketing for external customers and marketing for internal customers. Exact same process. Yeah. Exact same process. You have to view it as a marketing game. Yeah, I love that investor idea though. I've like not actually heard it laid out that way, but that's what it is. You have to understand that you're investing in that. You know, a lot of people are just, they, they're, they're whimsical. Well, I, I, people should find me. Everybody thinks that their job is more valuable. Mm -hmm. Like, like you, people need you more than you need them. I don't need them. I could fire them in a second. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. You can't, you mm -hmm. can't think that way. You can't think that, that way, especially if you want to grow your business or even just get out of the field. And I, I think the hard part yeah. is people, people are waiting for the results first before they then take the actions. Whereas yeah. you, know, you really need to understand that actually taking actions first can get you the results that you're seeking. If you're waiting for your business to finally calm down enough before you start putting systems in your business, you're going to be waiting a long time. If yeah. you're waiting for a business to finally settle down so you can put that training program together, or you know, you're waiting for this before you do this. Sometimes we, you know, as owners, we kind of have our priorities backwards where yeah. we think that I have to you know, wait for the results to happen before I start, you know, uh, before doing this. And um, really, when you finally take those leaps of faith of hiring your first technician, hiring your first office manager, hiring your first production manager, hiring your first salesperson, um, you know, getting your second location, getting another truck on the road. When you actually start taking those first leaps of faith, it's still terrifying the first time you do it. But after you've done it, I, I found that people are less you know, they're, they're less likely to, to, um, you know, delay in making those decisions the next time because yeah. they've seen the results from it. And the hard part is, is that first leap, you know, oh, taking yeah. that first jump and just kind of, but that's really where having someone who's done it before that's saying, you got this, this is yeah. exactly what you need to do. You got to trust the system. You got to trust the process because business is actually fairly simple. It, it's already a model. And it's just following it, even though it's scary. If you're scared, it's actually a good sign because you know to get somewhere you've never been means doing things you've never done before. So if you're yeah. uncomfortable, you're actually your business is telling you you're in the right place of when it's time to grow. Sometimes those freaky parts are your are the symptoms of your business telling you it's time to grow. If yeah. you're burnt out, you don't have enough time to do things in the day. It's your business telling you it's time to delegate, it's time to hire, it's time to build systems in place. Yeah. It's like a zip line park. If you've ever been, they say the longest line in zip line place is the first one because after you go off the first one, then everyone after that, it's like, Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get this. I know that. I know that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So I want to say what's up to uh, Adam, by the way, Adam Tothro is here. Uh, he said that they usually don't run from a business plan either. So yeah, yeah. that's uh, very, very true. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that, um, 
business plans can be overrated. You know, I think some people feel like, you know, a business plan is like this, you know, 12, 15 page long document. And then as soon as you get started, you realize that 90% of the stuff that you were planning on either didn't come true or, or I, I'm a really big fan of just putting together just like a budget at least of what you think is going to happen. And then just every month yeah. update it, you know, rather than just have the one single business plan, make something that's flexible so that you can start mm -hmm. getting data. I, I kind of liken this to the engineering process. If, if you come up with a brand new invention, the first thing you do is you build a prototype and the prototype's ugly. It don't look good. It's like, you know, you got right. duct tapes, you know, sticking stuff together. You got like batteries, you know, taped to the side of it because you, you know, don't have the 3D printed parts. You don't have all these. You just like building a rough prototype to just get a proof of concept. But you're testing certain parts of it, getting feedback, and then adapting it and getting your final working model. And you need that feedback. Sometimes we, we spend so much time building a production ready business plan. It's like, this is exactly what's going to happen all these different yeah. times. So much time working on it. It's the equivalent of building a finished product before you've even tested if anyone wants it, if, oh, if it yeah. even works right, if it gives you the desired results. So don't be afraid to just put together something really ugly and just kind of, you know, a start. When I first started, I just wrote down what I wanted my goals to be for the year. And they weren't super sexy or super, you know, detailed, but they were at least clear. And then over time, I honed in, you know, a more finished working budget and working model. Yeah. Instead of a plan, it's like a dream, or, you know, like it's like it's like riding your bike in the sand. You're, 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 you know exactly kind of where you're going, but I've never met anybody who could take a five year plan to make it happen to a T. Like that's just so mm -hmm. far out there, even like a full year. I don't. I can't remember one year in all my business life that I've ever made happen. What I wanted to in the beginning of the year happened by the end. I mean, pieces of it have, but then there's other pieces where like, I did twice as much as I thought I would do. So that goal was beat. You know, I've done half as much as I wanted to do or this and this. Corona happened. I couldn't hire the people that I wanted to, but at the same time, and you just never know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and don't my caution to anyone that's watching this is don't use that as an excuse to not do anything. Yeah. Because sometimes it, it could feel pointless to call your shots, to put any kind of a plan together, even if it's a rough, you know, rough one. Um, there's a study where people are 45 to 60 percent more likely to achieve their goals if they actually write them down. So just the physical yeah. act of writing them down and looking at them at a monthly basis and like incrementally working towards them can start making them happen. Yeah. And you know, that the important part is having that feedback loop always going back into your future model to make sure that, you know, you can make some adjustments. They're not big adjustments. They're like, you know, kind of trimming out the wings and ailerons of an airplane, you know, just yeah, like yeah. Barely trimming it in to make sure that you're kind of leveled off and you're going in the right direction. Yeah. Now let me ask you this. Are you a journaler or a logger? Do you have like books all over and are you writing everything down or do you focus on the business plan side of actually writing down your plan? So my, my process is this. First off, I start off with my high level goals as high as I can. And, and I, I take things in, in quarterly chunks. I'll, I'll do it for a full year, but I really look at like quarterly nice. chunks. And yeah. I'll write down everything that I want to accomplish for a given year. But then I'll take columns for 52 weeks in a really nerdy Excel spreadsheet. So like, <laughs> here's all my goals. And then I'm like, you know, week one, week two, week three, week there? four, yeah. all the way out here. And then I'll put a checkbox next to when I want to have that executed and done. Ah, nice. And the reason why I do that is when you build that out, you can take a look at all 52 weeks. And usually what ends up happening is, is that they'll be like really jam packed into the first couple months. You know, you'll see all these Xbox which tells you that it's not realistic to think that you're going to be able to do all that stuff within a short period of time. You can start spreading things out over time. And one of my favorite quotes is from Simon Sinek, which he talks about playing, um, you know, not to have a finite mindset in an infinite game. A finite game is like, there's a beginner, the beginning, there's an end, there's winners, there's losers, there's a set number of players. We know exactly what this is. Whereas an infinite game is players are always coming in and out. There's no ending. The goal yeah. is just to stay in the game. And so sometimes we always, we, we play our business to think that oh, I'm going to beat my competitors. I'm going to beat this. I'm going to be the winner. It's impossible to win in business. Yeah. Absolutely impossible because you may win one month and then the next month you're out of business. Yeah. And people are always coming in and out. So you have to look at it as just a, a you know, an infinite mindset that 
Um, you know, you're constantly feedbacking and improving your systems. Because if you're waiting for that golden hour to where all the systems in your business are 100% perfectly dialed in and you've arrived and it's there, uh, you're going to wait a long, long, long time Yeah. because it's it, you're always going to be kind of tweaking it. Whether it's you personally or other members on your team, you're always going to be tweaking it. You're always, people don't understand either when you're new, your goal may be, I want to make 25,000 in this year or 50,000 this year. Well, when you get to the point where you're doing 400,000 a month, your goal is going to be 500,000 a month. Like it's just the goals keep changing and then it's not far fetched. If you can do 400,000 in a month, 500,000 is not that far fetched. If you go from 25,000 a year to 500,000 a month, that's big deal, but you just you keep tailoring it. Yeah. And this and this really all kind of comes back to the employee conversation. So yeah. like for instance, let's say I got the goal I'm doing $200,000 of revenue this year. I want to get to 500,000 in revenue this year. The first part of my process when I, you know, would would look at incremental growth is I would say, okay, 300,000 of new revenue. How many leads is that? Well, I know my average ticket is going to be 500 bucks. I know that, you know, I'm going to have to uh, go see at least um, two customers before I, I get that average ticket, right? Yeah. So how many, how many leads do I need to get? That? How much am I paying for those leads? Um, how many leads do I have to see before I get that job? And then I divide my total number by that number of you know leads to give me an idea on how I need to put together my marketing plan and strategy. Yeah. Then the next part is the employees. Okay, I'm gonna need to get two more trucks. If I'm gonna do an extra $500,000, $300,000 in revenue, that's an extra one and a half, two trucks. I'm gonna have to go out, I'm gonna have to buy them. I'm gonna have to get the employees. I'm gonna have to hire them now, which yeah. means I need to put my job ads out during this week. And then as long as you look at the end goal and go through that critical step of working backwards and doing the math and figuring out, okay, now what activities do I have to do right now to ensure that I'm going in the right direction? Yeah. And, and too often what ends up happening is people have, you know, the, the hindsight, um, you know, they, they look backwards and see, well, how, how did I do this last year? Okay. I yeah. did this much. And it's just, it's just kind of like, well, I hope I arrive there and then I'll just, I'll just take a look at what I did. Whereas, you know, investors look forward and they think, yeah. okay, if I, if I put this investment in here over the course of X amount of time at this math, I should have this much of a return. And so it's just that investor mindset versus, you know, the, the owner operator mindset. It's just a completely yeah. different type of mindset. Here's a great question from Alan Steibritz, by the way. He said, do you have a plan to manage, manage independent contractors opposed to employees? Is it separate? Do you, your, your plans and your, your everything separate between the two, or do you kind of lump them into one? Yeah, there's a lot to talk about with, with regards to independent employees or independent contractors and employees. Um, yes, you have to treat them very, very differently. First of all, your independent 1099 contractors, you have to make sure that you're not providing them a schedule or, you know, providing them, um, tools and trucks and, and treating them like employees. They have to be completely independent. They have to have at least 30% of their own, or I'm sorry, at least 30% of their own revenue coming in. You can't be support, you know, supporting them with all that. There's a whole bunch of checks and balances for your independent contractors versus your employees. Um, but yeah, we would, we would have a separate process and plan for our contractors. I always like to work more on the employee side, myself personally, because it gives you a lot more control over the process. Yeah. And, um, you know, frankly, for us, our margins were better when we would just work in the employee side versus really? just the absolutely. Yeah. As opposed to independent contractors. Yeah. Now, if you're if you are terrible at managing employees and you're turning over employees once a month or once every two months, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe you're just like, man, I just need to go get some subs. But if you work on yeah. your management skills and get some good leaders to, to manage people, develop your company culture, get a good hiring and onboarding process. Um, to me, em employees are the way to go, especially in the exterior yeah. cleaning space. Well, I like that, that you have, and it sounds bad, I guess, if you're an employee listening right now, but you have control of an employee <laughs> where you can't le legally have control of a subcontractor. So if you have good benefits and you have good, uh, you know, just perks and everything in a great work environment, they're going to want to stay with you where a subcontractor has to find some of their work other places. They have to work with other people. It's not just paying somebody under the table. Oh, I make a lot more money when I, it's not that at all, you know? No, no, it's not. And actually, <clears throat> quick story. We had, uh, at one point, I had over half of my employees quit. 
because they were offered an opportunity to go make more money as a 1099 subcontractor. Yeah. And I sat down with a couple of them and tried to show them the math. It was like, you need to understand you're going to pay self-employment tax. You're going to be paying, yeah. you, first of all, you're, you're not going to have your own workers comp co coverage on yourself as an owner. So if you fall, you get hurt, you're on your own with that. Um, mm -hmm. So your, your percentage you're going to be paying to the government is higher. So even though it feels like more money, it's not, you're going to be paying more on that yeah. side. Plus your own truck, your own equipment, your own fuel. And we actually had uh, a couple of my employees come back to us after they had left. And one of them said, you know, Brandon, you'd never believe it on a job where I forgot something and missed, missed when they, he made me go back out on my own dime to go <laughs> fix it. And I was like, yeah, now imagine for yeah. me paying you to go on your own dime to fix it, except it's my dime. So, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I didn't miss the window, but I had to pay you to go back yeah. and get it. And he was like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. So, you know, sometimes bridging that gap, um, I'm a real big fan of uh, teaching employees how to read a profit and loss sheet because a lot of times employees, they'll assume the worst. They'll say, I, you know, a thousand bucks worth of work on the schedule. You're paying me $200. You're taking home 800 bucks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, you're you the know? big rich guy in your ivory tower. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't understand, you know, running a home service business, th the margins can be tight. The margins can be tight and the results, depending on, you know, how systemized your business in, you can be very profitable or you can be hardly profitable. And you may be taking those profits and expanding, buying more vehicles, buying more equipment, you know, expanding out. Yeah. So you, so the owner's not realizing those profits in the form of taking it out as cash. He might be reinvesting back into the business, thinking long term as an investor, you know, for that growth to happen. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that where when they see the check that they're bringing back to you, they don't quite. I mean, even when you hand an employee, you say, hey. This pure water system costs three thousand dollars. They go, oh wow, that's a lot, but they don't really know. It's not their three thousand dollars. It's not, you know, it's almost an unfathomable. They go, yeah, three thousand dollars, but you had three thousand dollars worth of checks yesterday. They don't realize that, you know, everything else adds into it. So, um, yeah. I do like that showing them behind the behind the sheet, you know, behind the curtain, if you will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, print out print out an example profit and loss. And we, we did this with every single one of our of our technicians. We would sit down and we would go through and show exactly how much it costs. Because then it also helps them to connect the dots with, you know, okay, well, Brandon has 30% of a budget of the gross revenue dedicated towards employee pay. For marketing, he has this percentage. You know, if we did our five rounds every single job, then that could help with the marketing cost be a little bit less and there'd be more margin for raises. Yeah. Well, you know, if we, if we follow the checklist on a, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, that would really, you know, affect this line here on supplies and tools. And we could have more percentage to move up to here, you know? Yeah. So it gets them connecting the dots on how they can actually have an impact to the business. And I was very, very transparent with my people. We had a profit sharing program in our company where if their numbers hit certain rev hour targets, they would actually get a profit share of the business. If the oh, business nice. was profitable, they would actually get that on a weekly basis, the profit yeah. share of the business. Wow. So it helps It helps to connect the dots rather than just hourly, where it's like, the only way I can make more money is if I work slower and yeah. you know more hours. It's like, yeah, yeah. no employee wants to do that. So performance yeah. is also another big part of it. Let me ask you an employee question. This is like, a really hard one and I'm putting you on the spot, but what was like the number one thing that you think you did to make a work environment exciting? Like to make employees love working for you, what was that one big thing that you would pass on to somebody? Focus on their dreams and their goals first. Have those conversations. One of the most impactful books I've read is uh, called The Dream Manager by Matthew Kelly. Go check it out. Um, it, was, it was honestly life-changing for me when it came to managing employees. Because what it what it helped us do is sit down with new team members and say, "Hey, what's your hopes and goals and dreams?" Not just, "Hey, where do you want to be in five years?" Tell yeah, us, yeah. Like, like, what are your dreams? What do you want to accomplish in life? And we would have people say things like, "You know what? I'm really into music. I would love to be a music producer. I'd love to be a graphic designer. I'd love to do web design. I'd love to be in sales. I'd love to be doing marketing." They would share with us this because, guess what, business owners. Not every employee you have, their dream is to grow up and be a window cleaner. Hate to break yeah, it to you. Weird. It's not everyone's dream. <laughs> for, some, for some business, for some employees, it may be a, you know, a, a really good career for them. 
It could be a stepping stone for them to get in their dream job. We had transparent yeah. conversations with our employees to say, hey, look, we know you may not be here for the rest of your life, but if you're here for two years, while you're here for these two years, we're going to help you achieve your dreams. We're going to give you free yeah. education on how to you know, get, get that marketing degree. We're going to help you out with um, you know, sit down with you and talk about how you could transition over to a salesperson or into a management position. Here's the roadmap for this. Yeah. Um, we gave people free access to lynda.com to, which is now LinkedIn learning uh, to where they could level up their stuff, you know, learn how to do Microsoft Excel and, and uh, you know, different other secondary skills, even management yeah. courses. Uh, we had business library full of business books that they could read and study. You know, maybe their, maybe their goal is to be their own business owner. And then immediately people are like, oh, well, you know, that's not, that's not going along with the business. Well, of course it is, you know, help, yeah. help them learn how to think like a business owner and watch the result to your bottom line when they start working in your business as if, you know, they have the mindset of an owner. And when people leave, don't yeah. view it as some terrible thing, like celebrate it, talk about it. You know, if it's something for their, their stepping up and leveling up their life. And so that, that whole environment that we created sounds very counterintuitive, but A, People stayed on a lot more longer because they'd never experienced a culture like this. B, they referred everyone to come work for our company because they said, no company has ever asked me these questions. No one has ever treated yeah. me this way. And C, even if they did leave, they would still tell everyone about, you know, that was one of the best jobs I ever had. It leveled yeah. me up and got me here. And it just changes the whole dynamic of, you know, of a company. And it, it starts attracting people in rather than just, you know, having a bunch of warm bodies just show up and just yeah. do the work. Like people are all aligned with the vision, you know, yeah. and having, having core values really dialed in and hiring compared to those values is also a super, super critical part to make sure you get the right people on the team. Yeah. John just said, bingo, dream manager. We have a half dozen employees working on their future career while working with us. And those are happy, our best employees. Man. Yeah. I love, yeah. It. I love it. There's nothing like a happy employee in general. Like some of us, have been doing this so even if you've only owned a business for a year or two or three or five that's so long that you are, have trouble you've been a business owner so long that you have trouble remembering what it would be what it was like to be an employee there's a whole different world <laughs> when you don't sleep breathe eat you don't escape when you own a business you don't have a time to yourself you don't have any of that stuff employees do when they leave by the time they get home they've forgotten about everything Thing. Like there's just a different culture. It's a different mindset. And sometimes it's very hard to kind of put the two together. Yeah. Yeah. Chris man, Simmons. So yeah. Chris Simmons just said too, in an industry that's not nine to five, how do you set expectation with employees that you may need extra hours in some weeks and less hours on other weeks? So again, our industry is very, very all over the place. You know, we're squirrels. When we get it, we get it. When we don't, we have to pull it from when we did, you know, how do you, how do you cope with that? Yeah. So for, for us, we, um, our performance pay system was probably one of the most critical parts of it. Our, our profit sharing program. Um, we had, we had some jobs that, uh, we had 36 gas stations that was on a regular route that we did once every six months went. And some of them would require two technicians to be on the road for two weeks with the trailer going around servicing all these locations. It was all night shifts. Wow. So, um, we provided bonuses and incentives and, you know, time and a half pay, uh, we provided uh, production bonuses if they got it completed within a certain window. Oh, nice. um, we gave them per diem so that they could, you know, get get something extra for for being it to where people would actually fight to be on that route because it was wow. such a, such an awesome, you know, awesome route for them. And then we had all kinds of other cool bonuses like, um, you know, them being able to, uh, you know, take their weekends and go fishing in different places. We had like, you know, um, destinations that they could go on the route that were just really fun, you know, to oh, kind of make cool. making it a road trip experience kind of a thing. But even with our industry, we would have some start jobs that have to be five o'clock in the morning, sometimes weekends, um, you know, sometimes these types of things. Uh, really, a, a really good dispatcher that communicates really well with technicians is also a big part of it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, reaching out to the people rather than just being like, hey, you and you, you're working early tomorrow or you and you, you're doing this. Um, having that really good, you know, centered balance um, for, you know, for communication uh, makes a really big difference, you know. Yeah. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the other part to it is in the performance based pay, when they directly connect the dots to, um, you know, some of these jobs that are off hours or, you know, or other things, they it's directly connected to uh, their profit sharing program. 
and you have our, you know, we had our dashboards of like first place to last place with all of our crews and their performance and how they did. That was a massive indicator to where people would pick up extra shifts. They would do extra stuff. And it just wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Most yeah. of the people that we hired, they liked the flexibility of the hour shifting a little bit, being in a different place every day. Um, you know, so it could be your pool of candidates that are coming in that might be not liking the nine to five. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Want, be wanting the nine to five. Yeah. Well, the big thing that I know too with doing, we did a lot of snow removal. So there was days that we would be, and I worked, of course, all of the hours, unfortunately. So there'd be days where I'd get off doing snow removal at like, you know, two in the afternoon and I'd be, you know, going to the office to work till 10. So, but for regular people that are employees, again, this isn't their livelihood. They're not going, well, someday this will pay off. They have to have some kind of regularity to their schedule. Even if the hours aren't regular, they still have to know that, okay, I got about eight hours that I'm doing this day. I have a substantial amount of rest time and off time, and then I get to do it again. So no matter how that stacks up, it's really hard to kind of run somebody and go, okay, well, you're doing nine to five this week. Monday, you start doing uh, seven to you know eight, and now you're doing 15 hour days and whatever else. And then we also need you to do weekends and you're just, you know, not everybody yeah. wants to work 60 hours a week. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, sometimes flexing a little bit too. Uh, we got to the point to where we had dedicated night crews so that, you know, people could just be a lot more consistent. Um, setting customer expectations. Sometimes we say yes too quickly to customers. We say, oh yeah, sure. No problem. We'll, we'll do this rather than pushing back and fighting for the technicians a little bit yeah. and saying like, you know, Hey, is it okay if we just get a little bit of a later start in here? Or, you know, is it okay? This is our consistent time. People crave consistency, you know? And yeah. so the, the more consistent that you can keep it, the better. And if you're just so quick to say yes to every employee or to every customer, no matter what, um, sometimes that can also lead to employee burnout. And if you're, if you're working people 60 hours, for crying out loud, go hire some more people. <laughs> Stop paying yeah, yeah. the time. Spread the wealth yeah, out no a kidding. little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It, and again, back to that mindset of kind of, these people work for me. You know, yeah, of course it'll be fine. I'll just tell them it'll be fine. Well, that doesn't build any kind of culture. Like you have, like you said, warm bodies that just happen to be there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Make sure that you focus on, make sure that you focus on um, serving your, your internal customers first your employees, yeah. Um, you, you got to ask them about it. I mean, you know, in the same way that you would market for your high-end wealthy customer that you want so badly, oh, that unicorn customer avatar, and you find them and you get them. And then when you get them, like you take care of them. You will, yeah. oh yeah, Mrs. Jones, we'll make sure we get the, oh sure, no problem. You know, everyone, you know, those critical key accounts. What's a harder sale? Going out and selling a thousand, two thousand dollar job to a rich homeowner or going out and selling to another person that they should come spend more hours with you every day than they do with their own families working for <laughs> you and your company. Like it's yeah. a, a way harder sale and B you actually still got to deliver. Yeah. And, and, and some people feel like, well, my business isn't sexy. I can't compete with these other, you know, companies that have bean bags and, you know, Google <laughs> benefits and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's totally wrong. There are people who love working for small family-owned businesses. In fact, they will quit a corporate job to come work for a small local family-owned business. Yeah. Um, if you treat them like family and you give them that feeling of belonging, or what I call air appreciation, inspiration, and recognition, like those are the three things that make all the difference in the world to people. So yeah. you know, making sure that you're providing them with that inspiration and and that feeling of belonging, like they belong to a family. Um, you, you'll get people, they won't, they'll stop complaining about working nine to five because they're just happy to be on the team. They're happy to give back because they know that you gave first and that you're, yeah. you're serving them first. And not only is it hard to get people, but like you said, imagine if your employees, half of them left at one time, like that would cripple anything that, I mean, you can't, there. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't split that up. So for somebody who says like, oh, they work for me, I could find another one in a heartbeat. No, you can't. Like the employees are the reason that you have that business. So I love the culture idea. Yeah, yeah, serve them first for sure. Well, thanks again, guys, for checking out WCR Nation. Again, if it's your first time here, thanks. Hope it was better than a cat video. Go back, watch everything you can. And most importantly, if you have any supply needs, I would love nothing more than to put your order in for you. Uh, it costs you nothing extra, and that's how I make my credit for it. Uh, my number directs 862-312-2026. There's so many of you 
who every single order, you're like, hey, Jersey, it's in my cart. Put the order in. I just want to say thank you. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it is the reason that I can live on a private island here in the Bahamas with my private helicopter. No, not really. But thank you either way. Uh, last one I heard was a brand name Kleenex. So thank you for the actual brand name Kleenex. Uh, again, if you guys want me to put your orders in for you, I would love nothing more. 862-312-2026. Save that number. Uh, call me with questions or putting orders in. And most importantly, if you're putting an order in, the code this week is going to be Brandon. If you tell me the word Brandon, you're going to get 5% off your total order. Just text me with the word or let me know the word or whatever. Brandon Vaughn's a really good guy. Uh, I want to use his name kind of as the code. So do that. Again, 862-312-2026. Uh, I hope you guys dug it all right. I know it was kind of like a weird ending there, but either way, it's good. It's done. Thank you so much. And uh, until next week, go out there and be epic.